Hello everyone. Welcome to our channel where we explore Christianity. Today we're diving into a crucial topic how to start reading the Bible effectively. First and foremost, the most important thing is to simply read the Bible. The method you choose is secondary and should be what works best for you. There's a particular system you might be familiar with, it's a good one, and requires minimal discipline. However, I chose not to follow it back when I learned about it. Why? Sometimes a specific passage in Scripture would captivate me, and I'd find myself re-reading it, comparing translations, and delving deeper into the context. For instance, I might be intrigued by everything God says about pride and proud individuals and spend a considerable amount of time studying that theme. This approach didn't align well with the parallel reading system, which involves reading different sections that often address various topics simultaneously. That said, I have read through the entire Bible several times and continue to do so. It's crucial to read the whole Bible, not just selected parts. It's beneficial for beginners to have a mentor who can help them understand the passages. We shouldn't impose a specific system on someone who is already reading the Bible, even if their reading is irregular. As long as they are consistently engaging with Scripture, there's no need to correct their approach. Personally, there were times when I read two chapters, and other times when I read several large books of the Bible in one sitting. It varies for everyone. We are all different, and this diversity will naturally affect each person's approach to reading the Bible. The key is to find a system that helps rather than hinders. If someone struggles with finding time for Bible reading or lacks discipline, then a structured system or any system can be helpful. However, if someone follows a different method than the one commonly accepted, it's important to maintain a positive attitude toward them, recognizing our unity in the core beliefs while respecting differences in minor practices. In summary, read the Bible in a way that works for you, seek guidance if needed, and remember that the goal is to engage deeply with God's Word in a manner that enriches your faith. You don't need X-ray vision to see that the world we live in is in a dire state. Most, if not all, of the crises we face stem from unbiblical worldviews. This unbiblical perspective has been adopted by many, even those who claim to believe in Yeshua, as the Messiah. Some have embraced this worldview in rebellion against the older generation. Others have been swayed by false teachers. Still, others have adopted it out of convenience or to assimilate into modern society and culture. Regardless of the reason for adopting this worldview, the result is the same partial, if not total, blindness. To understand what I am writing about today, you need to see that your worldview is like the glasses through which you view the world. If you look at the world through the lens of the Bible, the world becomes bright and clear. After all, the Bible tells us, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. However, if you view the world through an unbiblical perspective, it is like looking through a pair of dirty or darkened glasses that block the light of God's Spirit and truth. As a result, all you can see are shadows and darkness. This is precisely what we read in the following verses, and what is happening around us the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned 1 Corinthians 2.14. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ 2 Corinthians 4 3 6. The issue isn't just that unbelievers are blinded by an unbiblical worldview. The problem is that many believers are also blinded by the same worldview held by worldly and godless people. As a result, the very people who are supposed to proclaim the Messiah and let the light shine out of darkness are themselves blinded. As stated in Matthew 15, 14, let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Unfortunately, when the blind lead the blind, there is no one left to truly share the good news, and both fall into the pit. When Yeshua was asked which commandment is the greatest, he replied, Love God and love your neighbor, Matthew 22, 35, 40. In 1 John 2, 10, 11, we see that those who genuinely love their brothers live in the light, allowing the radiance of God's love to dispel darkness 
and free the spiritually blind from their blindness anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going, because the darkness has blinded them 1 John 2 10 11. You can see how dangerous it is for a person to let a non-biblical worldview penetrate their mind and heart. Not only does this darkness blind believers in Yeshua, but it also causes us to hate our brothers. Ultimately, it leads to the blind leading the blind straight into a pit. It is impossible to love God while hating your brother whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen 1 John 4.20. Many of us start with good intentions when it comes to reading the Bible. But before we take a step, mobile screens distract us, family concerns overwhelm us, and we rush from the start. So how can busy people, living life to the fullest, implement the good intention of setting aside time for the Bible? Remember the question why, let's remind ourselves of the first why, why do we even open the pages of the Bible? To check a box. To gain more information? Is this really important? Hear God's invitation in Isaiah 55, 1, 3, come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Give ear and come to me, listen, that you may live. Nourishing our hungry souls with Scripture is a matter of life and death, as seen in Deuteronomy 32.47 and John 6.63. The living words of the living God are the food our souls need for life. The Bible on your coffee table or bookshelf, whether it is collecting dust or has worn pages from years of use, is not just an ordinary book. It is alive because its author is risen Hebrews 4.12. What happens when we respond to God's call? When we diligently listen to Him, incline our ears, and come to Him, we ultimately feed on what is good. Just as enjoying something delicious brings satisfaction, there's a positive cycle here diligence leads to enjoyment, and enjoyment deepens diligence. The plan that answers how we come to God's Word is to personally meet Jesus Christ enjoy fellowship with Him, know Him, and prepare for eternal life with Him, Luke 24, 27. But how do we do this practically? Five minutes light snack. Sometimes we eat what's convenient when we're hungry. Isn't that what we do when our stomachs rumble? When hungry, we reach for what's most accessible. So it's wise to keep nutritious food nearby. The same applies to engaging with God's Word. If we keep the Bible in a visible place, it's easy to turn to it instead of social media the fast food of our time. If you have five minutes before work, before the kids wake up, during lunch, or before family dinner, simply choose a passage from Scripture for a light snack. Spend a few minutes reflecting on God's character or His promises based on the text you read. End with a brief corresponding prayer. You can even write down a verse or truth to remember and contemplate throughout the day. 10 to 15 minutes full meal a snack satisfies hunger temporarily, but our stomachs usually require a full meal. The same applies to Scripture our souls won't be satisfied if we only snack on the Word. We need to nourish our souls with truth. We often call this quiet time and may feel inadequate if it doesn't look a certain way. However, God doesn't prescribe a specific format in His Word. See Deuteronomy 6.5.6, Philippians 2.16, John 15.4. He wants us to prefer meeting Him through Scripture, however it may look. He wants us to thirst for Him the bread of life rather than formulas. He desires us to pursue our perfect Savior Jesus, not an idealized quiet time that doesn't exist see John 5 39, 40. So what might a 10-15 to 15 minute meal look like? Spend the first five minutes reading a chapter from the Bible. Use the next five minutes to ask questions about the text, what does this tell me about God? About myself? About the world? About the church? About the spiritual realm? After reflecting, use the last five minutes for prayerful response. Thirty minutes and beyond feast if good food nourishes our bodies. A feast is an extended version of that pleasure, usually involving multiple courses and a lengthy, enjoyable meal. Hopefully you can find thirty minutes or more in your schedule to spend time with Jesus, diving into His Word. You can read a significant portion or all of the chapters from your Bible reading plan for the day. Consult commentary or interpretation to deepen your understanding. Journal your questions and thoughts on the passage, and then respond to them in prayer. During this time, you could even aim to memorize a longer passage from Scripture. Remember, 
Your primary spiritual feast happens during church services when your pastor preaches from the Word of God. See Colossians 3.16. He has earnestly prepared a feast for you to nourish your hungry soul. We often forget that Scripture was intended for God's people in assembly, not just individuals. Receive the preached Word as a gracious gift from the Lord, an opportunity to contemplate Christ and be transformed by His Word. Just come. However you come to Christ's Word, whether for a snack, a meal, or a feast, the future glorious banquet awaits you see Revelation 19.6.10, and it's worth every moment spent. With thousands of pages and 66 books in the Bible, the perennial question for new believers is, where do I start reading the Bible? Many seasoned believers also ponder the same question. After finishing one book, they often wonder how to proceed next. Many Christians have experienced times when they either haven't read the Bible for a while or read it inconsistently, finding it difficult to know where to start again. Here are some suggestions for Christians asking themselves where to begin reading the Bible. Firstly, start with Psalms. I love Psalms. There are times when I read only Psalms, especially during challenging times in my life. Reading about David's battles and how he was able to praise and worship God through it all is so encouraging for me and gives me strength to do the same. Additionally, when reading psalms, I often come across lyrics from my favorite worship songs. I love to draw a musical note next to these verses. Secondly, read Proverbs. Did you know that there are 31 Proverbs, one for each day of the month? You could read Proverbs every month, and it would be very helpful. There is an expression, one proverb a day keeps the devil away. Thirdly, read the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is the most descriptive account of Jesus' life. I like to think this because he was a doctor and paid attention to every detail. If you want to truly know Jesus, read the Gospel of Luke. And when you finish, flip through the next two books and read what he wrote next the Acts of the Apostles. Believers. Fourthly, there is the Gospel of John. If you want to understand the depth of Jesus' love and sacrifice, read the Gospel of John. John truly unveils the path of salvation through Jesus Christ. We see this in the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16. Although not written in chronological order like Luke's Gospel, you can observe the meticulous and purposeful structure in John's book aimed at telling the story of the salvation that Jesus brought to the world. Fifthly, there is the Epistle to the Ephesians. Are you struggling with your past? Do you wrestle with feelings of guilt and condemnation? Do you often feel like a foster child of God? Read the Epistle to the Ephesians. In his letter to Ephesus, Paul filled each chapter with reminders of who we are in Christ, our rights as his children, and the authority he gives us through his Holy Spirit. Sixthly, there is the Epistle to the Philippians. If you have lost your joy, open the Epistle to the Philippians. Read it, study it, meditate on it, and allow each verse to penetrate your spirit. These are some of my favorite books in the Bible. Here are a few tips for reading the Bible if you are just starting out. Don't start with Genesis and don't just read from cover to cover, unless you are an experienced Christian who has regularly read the Bible for a long time. Many Christians who have applied this approach to reading the Bible have found themselves stuck on the books of Leviticus or Numbers and, feeling disappointed, stopped reading. They read each book in its entirety. By reading the entire book rather than selecting verses here and there, you will grasp the full context. Sometimes you will be surprised by how a well-known verse acquires a completely new meaning in the context of the entire history or overarching idea. Read until three things become clear. It's important to read until these three things become clear and not to move forward without this understanding. Write them down and reflect on them throughout the day. Keep notes. Take a simple spiral-bound notebook and start writing down your thoughts on what you've read. Every day, write one or two sentences on how the passage you read can be applied to your life, and also write a simple prayer. If you follow these four pieces of advice while reading one of the six books of the Bible listed above, you will soon notice that you want to spend more and more time reading the Bible every morning. Another method is to start reading the Bible with the New Testament specifically with the Gospel of Mark, the shortest good news about the life and preaching of the incarnate Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Then read the other Gospels, Luke, Matthew, John. After that, read the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles of the Apostles. It's important to remember that in the Orthodox Bible, more precisely in the sacred scripture of the Old Testament, besides the 39 canonical books, there are also 11 non-canonical ones, Tobit, 
Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Jesus, Son of Sirach, Letter of Jeremiah, Baruch's. Second and Third Books of Ezra, Three Maccabees Books. The division of books into canonical and non-canonical is due to the absence of these last eleven books in Jewish primary sources and their presence only in Greek, i.e., in the Septuagint, the translation of the Seventy Interpreters. In turn, Protestants, starting from Martin Luther, rejected the non-canonical books, mistakenly assigning them the status of apocryphal, as for the twenty-seven books of the New Testament, both Orthodox and Protestants recognize them. It concerns the Christian part of the Bible. Written after the birth of Christ, the New Testament books testify to the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ and the first decades of the Church's existence. These include the four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, seven general epistles, fourteen epistles of the Apostle Paul, and the Revelation of John the Theologian, or Apocalypse. Most personal spiritual catastrophes and global catastrophes in terms of religious movements and denominations occur precisely because a person either does not read the entire Bible or, having read it all, relies only on favorite passages. The first enemy is the reductionism of reading to what is understandable to you and what you are ready to accept. Therefore, it is safer and methodologically correct to start with the New Testament. Because only in the light of the New Testament can we understand the Old Testament. The old law finds its fulfillment for the benefit of every believer. Etymologically, our word goal comes from the Greek telos which in translation means goal end, that is, achieving the goal. But even when reading the New Testament, we still become acquainted with the Old Testament because we encounter many quotations from there on its pages. For example, in the first epistle of the Apostle Peter, the doctrine of Christ's descent into Hades is presented this is perhaps the only moment in the New Testament. This pertains to the dogmatic teaching of the Church, and it should be taken very seriously. However, we see that saint. Augustine did not see such a meaning in these lines, he interpreted them differently. There is nothing wrong with this, because saint. Augustine did not reject the teaching of Christ's descent into Hades. It was simply his understanding of a specific passage of Scripture. So here one must be prepared for the plurality of opinions that exists among the Holy Fathers. Another vivid example is the vision of the prophet Ezekiel about the dry bones, which become covered with tendons, flesh, and rise again. For us, this is a prophecy about the general resurrection. But Blessed Jerome says that there are already many prophecies about resurrection in the scriptures, so this is simply a prophecy about the return of the Jews from captivity. Understanding the Bible often reveals surprising new meanings when considered within the broader context of history and overarching ideas. It's crucial to keep reading until certain key insights become clear three essential points that should be recorded and pondered throughout the day. Keeping a spiral-bound notebook handy is recommended to jot down thoughts on what you've read. Each day, write one or two sentences reflecting on how the passage you've read could be applied to your life and include a simple prayer. By following these four steps and reading one of the six books of the Bible listed above, you'll likely find yourself increasingly drawn to spend time with the Bible every morning. Another effective method is to start reading the Bible with the New Testament, specifically with the Gospel of Mark, the shortest account of the life and teachings of the incarnate Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. After that, proceed to read the other Gospels, Luke, Matthew, and John. Then continue with the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles of the Apostles. It's important to remember that in the Orthodox Bible, specifically in the sacred scriptures of the Old Testament, there are not only 39 canonical books but also 11 non-canonical ones, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Jesus, Son of Sirach, Letter of Jeremiah, Baruch, and the second and third books of Ezra, and the three Maccabean books. The division of books into canonical and non-canonical ones is due to the absence of the last 11 books in Jewish primary sources and their presence only in Greek, i.e., in the Septuagint, the translation of the Seventy Interpreters. In turn, Protestants, starting with Martin Luther, rejected the non-canonical books, mistakenly labeling them as apocryphal. As for the 27 books of the New Testament, they are recognized by both Orthodox and Protestant churches. This refers to the Christian part of the Bible written after the birth of Christ. The New Testament books testify to the earthly life of Jesus Christ and the first decades of the Church's existence. These include the four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the seven Catholic Epistles, the fourteen Epistles of the Apostle Paul, as well as the Revelation of John the Theologian of Theologian, or the Apocalypse. 
Most personal spiritual catastrophes and global crises within religious movements and denominations occur precisely because people either do not read the entire Bible or, having read it all, use only their favorite passages. The first enemy is the reductionism of reading to what is understandable to you and what you are ready to accept. Therefore, it is safer and methodologically more correct to start with the New Testament. Because only in the light of the New Testament can the Old Testament be understood. The old law finds its fulfillment for the benefit of every believer. Etymologically, our word goal comes from the Greek telos, which in translation means goal, end, that is, the achievement of the goal. But even when reading the New Testament, we still become acquainted with the Old Testament because we encounter many quotations from it on its pages. For example, in the first epistle of the Apostle Peter, the doctrine of the descent of Christ into Hades is set forth, this is perhaps the only moment in the New Testament. This pertains to the dogmatic teaching of the Church and should be taken very seriously. Nevertheless, we see that Blessed Augustine did not see such meaning in these lines and explained them differently. There is nothing wrong with this either because Blessed Augustine did not reject the teaching of Christ's descent into Hades. It was simply his understanding of a specific place in Scripture. So here one must be prepared for the plurality of opinions present among the Holy Fathers. Another vivid example is the vision of the prophet Ezekiel about the dead bones which grow tendons, flesh, and rise. For us, this is a prophecy about the general resurrection. But Blessed Jerome says that there are already many prophecies about the resurrection in Scripture, so this is simply a prophecy about the return of the Jews from captivity. Understanding sacred Scripture requires a systematic and sequential approach. Starting with the New Testament is preferable as it helps to grasp the history of salvation, which finds its completion in Christ. It's important to note that church teachings and interpretations of Scripture may vary among different holy fathers and scholars. This diversity should not instill fear or doubt, but should encourage deep study and understanding of the variety of views. Reading the Bible should not be merely an academic exercise, but a spiritual practice involving prayer and reflection. This helps to apply the teachings practically in one's life. Reductionism in reading, where only what is immediately understandable or agreeable is considered, poses a danger. It can lead to oversimplification and missing the depth of biblical teachings. Understanding the historical and cultural context in which biblical texts were written helps to delve deeper into their meaning and relevance to contemporary life. These conclusions aim to foster a more meaningful and profound approach to reading and studying the Bible, making this process not only spiritually enriching but also practically applicable in daily life. Recognize the diversity of thought among scholars and theologians throughout history. Allow these varied perspectives to enrich your understanding rather than confuse it. Embrace the journey of discovery with openness and humility. By approaching Scripture in this way, you cultivate a deeper spiritual connection and a more profound appreciation for its teachings. Let your study of the Bible be a transformative experience that enriches your faith and guides your life's journey with wisdom and grace. Join our community of seekers and believers on our channel as we delve into the transformative wisdom of Scripture. Subscribe today to embark on a journey of spiritual discovery. Dive into insightful discussions, thought-provoking reflections, and enriching teachings that resonate with your life's journey. Don't miss out on the opportunity to deepen your understanding and grow in faith. Subscribe now and let's explore the beauty and truth of the Bible together.